So today we're going to add another tool or weapon, if you prefer, to our repertoire of methods of techniques. We're going to cover shear stress today, and we're going to learn what that means and how that relates to what we've already done. You guys with me? Shear stresses. Okay, so first let's back up and remember what we know about axial stresses. An axial stress is when we have a member that's loaded, everything we're doing in this class has that, and we're talking about a force and we're evaluating its effect on a perpendicular area. Which means if we look at the unit normal of the area, then the force and the unit normal are parallel. But more often we're thinking it's a force perpendicular to an area. So this figure 11A, we see we have a section cut that's perpendicular to the force. The stress is just P over A. You guys comfortable with that idea? Great. Now in figure B, we're gonna see a typical shear stress kind of application. Let's say we have a plate and we have a couple supports and now we take some other member and we jam it like a punch. This is how they shear off thin sheets and things like this. There's a punch like that in, uh, in one of the labs there at school. And if we shear that off, you can see that it just cuts off. This is kind of what a hole punch does, right? It's got a hole and it's got a punch and they're really close tolerance. And when you slip the paper between the punch goes and because it's so tight, it just shears off that little cut. Now the forces that we're applying are so much more than the allowables of the material that we normally don't even think that there's a, a stress that developed that was exceeded. Unless we take a big stack of like 20 or 30 papers and then we try and do the same thing, and, right? And then everything gets all distorted. You with me? We're gonna find out later, we're gonna look at shear stresses again we're gonna find out that when we have a shear, we normally have, we have a force, a perpendicular distance. And whenever we have a force and a perpendicular distance, we have a moment. So we're gonna get shear when there's also moments. And we're gonna find out that there's actually a change in stress distribution across the structure. We're not ready to deal with that yet. If we have a really short line of action, like a punch, where we have one material, another material, and we're forcing that member to take all that shear in a really close area like this picture here. You can see that the A and the B blocks are so close together. There's no eccentricity between the force and that area. So that, that surface that is parallel to the force actually experiences that and it just shears right off along that plane. If you imagine, that on this, uh, let's say that this member D is a big chunk. Let's say we go to a big redwood and we cut it and we cut it and we have a little slice of redwood that's this big. And then we set it on a little round thing with a hole. And then we come in here with our fist and we go and right along the little surface, those little tree rings that are so cool, it just shears right off. Do you see that? Uh, what value does it shear off? Well. We take that force and we take that shear area. Now, in this case, what we're looking at is a plate. We have two supports. We have a punch coming down. And so we can see there's actually two forces. We can see that by symmetry, our reactions at B and C are P over two. And if we draw that out, we see that what we're getting here is this member is going to be forced right through the plate. We're going to end up, if we look at this plate right along here, there's little area and we're getting a little shear force here of P over two. We can see the action reaction pairs here. And this force here is actually driving a force here, action reaction pairs here. Do you see that? If we take a closer look at this part of it, we see we have this force and it's being reacted here and here. And these little forces V, these reactions are simply P over two. Do you see that? Oh, 
Okay, you guys got that idea? All right. So if we wanted, and you can imagine if we looked, if we actually drew the whole part, the whole part actually probably looks like this, right? We've actually got a plate like this and there's another plate sitting on top of it. And when we jam this down, we can see we're cutting into a shear area there and back here. Do you see that? So we can see there's actually a shear area here and on the other side. That means this force here is being reacted along here by this force P over two and over here by P over two. You see that? So our stress, once again, with an axial force, our stress was, our axial stress was just P over A. It was P over the perpendicular area. For shear stress, we're gonna also find out it's just P over the, and now it's the parallel area. You see that? So if we have an I-beam, and we shear that puppy off, we would take that force, we take this area. How many guys can calculate that area? Hopefully. And we have the force, P over A. Is that a shear stress or an axial or normal stress? Normal. You guys understand what axial stress is? Like ten, how, many yeah, guys have a, yeah. how many guys have a grandpa that ever said, pull my finger? Axial stress, then he does something, right? That's an axial stress. We also call that a normal stress because the force is perpendicular to the area, right? If we have a shear stress, how many guys ever got an Indian burn where they grab your arm and they go, <laughs> right? That is the force is parallel to the air. If you picture your skin, if you take a little cross section through the skin, you can just see a little piece of the skin, a little strip of it, and we got a little force there, force over area. That's a shear stress. Pulling on it this way would be a normal stress. You guys got the difference? So in the simplest manner, we can say that Normal stresses can be as simple as P over A, and shear stresses can be as simple as P over A. The question is, what is the force acting on the area, and what is the area that's parallel to that force? In this case, this force, which pushes down on the block, is reacted by two reactions. Those two forces are P over 2. So the shear stress on this surface here is P over 2. That's the force over area which is whatever this length is and that thickness. Got it? That is the idea of shear stress. This is a fundamental principle that must be mastered. Okay, we can call it. So remember with normal stresses, we use the symbols for this guy. We said it's stress equals P over A, or actually a lot of books say stress equals P over A. This sigma is analogous to F, right? With shear stresses, we can also use F and tau. Tau is the common symbol for shear stress, excuse me. And a lot of times we will put a little subscript here, S, to show that it's shear. However, this is just a stress, and we can tell if it's perpendicular, it's a shear stress. I mean, if it's parallel to the area, it's a shear stress. True, Dad? Okay. All right. I think we got a good foundation now to start looking at how this looks uh, and our other principles that we learned about. We're going to learn about deflection of shear stresses, strain for shear stresses, running load for shear stresses, allowables for shear stresses, and strain energy for shear stresses. And all of this is almost lomismo to what we did before. It's just for shear stresses. True that? Do we expect shear stress allowables to be the same as normal stress allowables? Let me ask you a question. Hold your arm out like this and say somebody pushes on your arm. 
Can you imagine the force it takes that you can withstand? You're trying to stop them. You're trying not to go, to move. Can you imagine about how, about how many pounds you think you can take before you move much? 50 pounds, 20 pounds. Now imagine that same person is yanking on your arm axial. You can take a lot more, right? We're stronger that way. And our bodies hold together better that way. And materials are people too. So we're going to find a different shear allowable than we have for normal allowables. And we'll deal with that shortly. Okay. Next idea. So this is what we saw where we have a line of action where the, we're getting a force acting on an area and the area and the force are parallel to each other. Our stress can be written P over A or P over A. Our units then are PSI, same as we've been using. And our procedures just figure out what's the force, figure that's back to statics, figure out what the area is, that's back to trig, calculate our force, our stress on the section and figure out our allowable right, our margin of safety. Where you can see now, since we have a shear stress FS, we're gonna be comparing to a shear allowable FS and usually it's gonna be an ultimate allowable FSU. Got it? So you'll notice this margin of safety equation is the same allowable stress divided by applied stress, whichever one the max is, minus one. But in this case, since our stress that we're trying to evaluate is shear, we will need to use the shear allowable for it. Just like if we're evaluating a margin of safety on our arm motion, we would have a different allowable for pullage versus pushage. Okay. Great. And same idea here, just figure out the force and here's a little example. If you just imagine this with this thing slid over, you've got a bolt. And if you load that up in shear, see how that bolt fails right along that shear plane? This is very common for all the fasteners in industry, rivets, bolts, and other things, which one of the failure modes we're going to be evaluating is we're going to figure out what is the force acting trying to break that fastener. If you take a section cut, like you just imagine, you have a you have two sheets and you have a fastener holding them together. Take your hacks. How many guys ever grabbed a hacksaw blade, right? You took it out of the saw and you grab it with your hand and you're trying to cut something and get your hand all torn up. How many guys ever did that? Yeah, some of you guys might be smarter than me, I guess. I've done that a bunch of times. Sometimes it's the more convenient way. If you just imagine your hacksaw blade, you slip it between the materials and you start, we've got these things bolted together. We start until it fails, right? Just like that. This is one of the major checks we need to make in industry. Got it? We're going to be dealing with this a little bit next lecture and a lot of bit next semester. If we go back to our idea about that whole idea of stress tensors that we've kind of touched our little toes into, if we look at a little incremental element, we can see, remember stresses, tensor stresses are a stress. A lot of times we'll use sigma for a normal stress and tau for a shear stress. However, we can call them all sigma because our subscripts tell us about whether it's shear or normal. For example, you'll notice this little guy here, this stress is on the, which, which one comes first? Which indice? The area, normal, or the force direction? The area, area normal. Yeah, baby. So we see this sigma xz is the stress on the x face, which means the normals in the x direction, and then that is oriented in the Z direction, okay? And what we're gonna learn is stresses are, uh, shear stresses are romantic little buggers. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute here. But if we, so we see this one, we see this one here, 
This is acting on the X face in the Y direction, on the Y face in the X direction. This is on the Y face in the Z direction, X, that's wrong, Z face in the Y direction. You see that? You'll notice a trend here, right? Whenever we have these, so if we look down on this, we say we have a little element like this and we have a force here, a stress here and a stress here, right? And actually for action reaction pairs then, let's just say this is thin, right? Then we would actually say, well, for equilibrium, that means we're gonna have a reaction over here and a reaction over here. Do you see that? And actually if we summed our moment, if this was a little incremental element where it's just a one by one by one by one element, we would see that this stress on that face is a force and this stress on this face is a force. And if we sum moments about here, this stress times this full distance and this stress times this distance, that's gonna sum to zero. You see that? This times this distance is giving us a moment this way. And this one times this distance is giving us a moment this way. And if this is a little incremental one by one by inch element, then the stress here on the same thickness, that's going to give the same force, same force. That means the moment sum to zero. And that's the beauty of shear elements when they're in pure shear. We're going to deal with that in a minute. But they're romantic little mothers. Look, if you look at this guy here, now if we're focused on this face here, we see we've got this stress and this stress, which means for equilibrium, both of those relate to a force. We're going to get back there. You see, and just imagine this is really thin now, okay? And if we look at this guy here, if we look on the forward face, we got this stress and this stress, which is actually reacted like this. You see that? And we can just, and we're gonna find with shear stresses, this, this shear stress, these are the same, these are the same. And actually this, we could just call out one shear stress value and all these vectors have the same stress. You'll notice, look at this. Look at this little vector, right? Imagine that's the mouth. You notice how these vectors are mouth to mouth? Imagine their little toesies here and their little toesies are interlocked. Right? Isn't that romantic? Look, mouth to mouth, toe to toe, mouth to mouth, toe. This is how shear force stresses are. They are so romantic. We have a shear stress like this. All we need a little incremental element. All we need to say is our shear stress is in that direction. And we know, well, that means this one down here has got to be mouth to mouth. And this one over here has got to be toe to toe. Mouth to mouth, toe to toe. And that is, and we can just show one of these and that shows us the direction. Just drawing one arrow tells us about all the shear stress in the element. You see that? It's the same thing with your skin. If you do this, you're gonna get a stress here, but just, just a little bit over here, you got another stress going this, and this is why it hurts. And actually you're gonna get another stress that normally you don't think about pushing out here and pulling back here. At least if you're a shoot of aluminum you were. If you grabbed all sides, now, if you just grab this, that's just bending. But if you actually supported this on all sides, or if this was a continuous sheet and we looked at a little incremental area and we applied a shear force this way, we're gonna get a reaction here and we're gonna get another, we're gonna get resistance. As this thing moves this way, this is sliding and this is gonna develop a reaction. And actually, as this is moving, this is sliding. And so this is developing. So if we're going like this, we're gonna get a reaction like this and we're gonna react, it's actually a force like this that causes a force like this to cause this part to get longer and this part to get shorter. And that's what we're gonna see with shear stresses. So let's say we have a little element, we're looking at the edge of a part and let's say we have a shear stress like this. Do we know all the arrows for our shear stress? Yes, we know this is gonna be mouth to mouth, toe to toe, right? Or you can think of it this way. If I have a shear stress like this, the reaction over here has to be this way. And then you think, okay, these guys are really romantic. That means mouth to mouth and toe to toe, mouth to mouth and toe to toe. You see that? And there's no moment, it's just pure. This is called pure shear. We're actually getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We're gonna see this in a moment. That is called pure shear. Why? Because it's in shear and there's no moment. Got it? Now you might be confused because we're talking about stresses and we're talking about moments. Well, if we took this shear stress and we multiplied by this area, what do we have? A force. force. And if we take this sum of, mo that means we have a force here. This stress corresponds with a force. This stress corresponds with a force. And if we sum moments about here and this is a one by one element, then actually the sum of moments is zero. Got it, is that beautiful? 
you may not fully appreciate the beauty. It's kind of like, uh, well, maybe I won't give you a bad analogy. That's a change, right? Okay, you guys ready to move on? Okay, next idea, the idea of running loads, okay? Now, remember going back, we learned before, uh, yeah, so shear stresses are gonna be mouth to mouth and toe to toe. And uh, we will deal with when it's, uh, we're gonna deal with direct stress versus pure shear stress in just a moment. So stand by, that's uh, answering your question in the chat. Okay, running loads. We saw before we have an element like this. If we have a force on this, we could talk about the force on the thing, the normal force. We could talk about the normal stress. And we also can talk about the normal running load, right? The force is just the force acting on the member. The stress is just the force per unit area where the area is perpendicular to the force. And the running load is the force per inch. Now you'll notice here that this little element, actually, even though I'm not drawing it here, it actually has a thickness that we're not showing, right? So we wanna talk about the stress as just P over A. And if we call this dimension, the height of this thing B and the thickness of this thing T, then actually the stress is just P over BT. When we think about running loads, so anytime we have a force acting on an area, the four, it's just P over A, right? That's our stress. But we can also think about the running load. And we talk about a running load. The running load is the force over the major dimension, the longer dimension. So it's force over B, right? Which one's bigger, B or T, right? Usually we assign B. T to the thin dimension. So the running load is force over the larger dimension. That means it's like having that force acting here. Let me draw it down here. This force acting like this is just like this force. Look, that's a running load. This force P on that surface is like this running load N on this length. And it's just like this stress acting on this area. You see that? So actually P over A is stress. P over B is the running load. And so if I wanna talk about the stress, I can say it's P over A, or I can say it's N over T. Because remember we calculated N by dividing by the larger dimension. So the only dimension left to put on the bottom is the thickness. This goes back to lecture one. I didn't cover it in lecture one very well because we're moving fast. One question on there, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that running load is not necessarily actually, right? It could be. Well, right now we're talking about axial load. It could be tension or compression. That's what we learned in lecture one. But now we're about to say, good question, Leon. Let me clean this up. We're about to say that this also applies to shear stresses. If we apply a force, let's say we have a little member like this and we apply a force here, it's gonna be reacted here. And if this is a continuous piece, we could say, oh, well this actually, this force is gonna cause a stress P over A, or we can talk about the running load P over B, that is the pounds per inch. You'll notice that this is 10 inches for every inch we have that many pounds per inch. You see that? See how that works? What's the shear stress? It's just the N over the T. We divide by the other dimension. So coming back to here, this is appropriate for like, if we look at aircraft skins and such, where we have uh, the place where we really, the running loads really mean a lot is when we're talking about like skins, the structure that's so large that a better way to talk about the stress intensity or the load intensity is running load rather than just axial force. So our shear stress is just that. So a lot of times, so we use force 
in the past, we used F for forces, right? But now we're kind of steering away for that. We're using P for forces a lot more because capital F is our allowable in aerospace, right? When we're dealing with a shear force, a lot of times we'll use S as our force because that gives draws attention to the idea that that is a shear force. Do you guys see that? So we might see P or F or S as symbols representing shear stress. And if we have a force on here, the stress is just P over A, right? The running load is just S over the larger dimension B in this case, right? That's the running load. And a lot of times for shear stresses. Now, remember back to normal stresses, if we call this our X direction and this our Y direction, then we would call this an X because it draws attention to the idea that it's in the X direction. So for shear stresses, a lot of times we'll say X, Y because it draws attention to the idea that a pure shear stress is gonna be this romantic guy, which not only has this shear, but also it's gonna be coupled with a shear like this. You got that? Okay. So running loads are just gonna be that force over the larger dimension and the stress, once you have a running load, we can calculate the stress by just dividing by the thickness, the remaining dimension that wasn't used yet. Okay, next idea. Now we're gonna deal, before we get to strains, we're gonna deal with a couple special cases of what we just learned. For example, imagine a button. This little thing has a head and it has a little shaft. And let's say there's a hole and you're trying to pull it through there. You can think of countless situations like this, right? Like let's say, you uh, have an umbrella and you fall through the ice and there's no water below the ice. And so you fall down until the umbrella grabs the hole, right? The first thing you can do is say, oh, well, if I'm evaluating this puppy, the first thing I can do is I can take this force and divide by the perpendicular area here, pi over that, p over that area. And that's going to be the actual stress in that part. No matter where I draw a section cut, it's going to be the same stress, p over A and the A is just pi D over two squared, right? That's gonna be true until we get up here. Once we get up here and we get, you'll notice that, so this thing actually looks like this. And we look at the side of it, it looks like this. So when we pull on this, we can say, okay, all through here, no matter where we take a section cut, we just have a P over A. What kind of stress is that? Axial. Axial. Axial, another word for that is normal stress, okay? And then you'll notice what happens when it gets up to this. Now what happens is, look at this, imagine, see how this is? And see how this is thin? Actually, imagine that thing, which is all integral, and it pulls through, and now there develops a little shear stress that tries to rip that little circular piece out of the other piece. You see that? Like this shown here. See how if we say, okay, what? So first, this force causes a normal stress. No matter where we take a cross section through this puppy, it's a normal stress P over A. That's our normal stress. But then we get up here. Once we get into the head, we can say, okay, if this we're going to try and if this little shaft is going to try and pull out of the head, it would have to shear off this little area. The circumference of this is just pi D which is the same thing as two pi r. Remember that for some circumference of a circle? And then the thickness of this part is just T. So actually, we actually have a shear stress, which is P over the area, which is two pi r T. That is the shear stress. So first of all, this thing has to be good for, we could write a margin of safety of FTU divided by that normal stress P over A minus one. And then we could write a margin of safety for FSU divided by the shear stress minus one. You see that? And actually, if this one fails, that means it ripped off here. And if this one up here fails, then that means it ripped right out of the head. You got it? Is that cool? Can you imagine applications for that? Right? Like, let's say you machine a little thing with this shape, and then you drop it through a hole and you have some part that's yanking on it. First, it has to be good along the shaft and then it has to make sure that that head. Now, what happens if it fails in, in axial load? Well, then you make the head bigger. 
What happens if it rips out according to the shear stress? Well, all you got to do is make the head thicker and that will increase your area. Or you can increase the diameter and that will also increase your area. See how that works? And then if you're good for that, then you could look out here and the next place it might fail, if you imagine, oh, it also, if you imagine this whole way out here where it corresponds with this, this larger button, we could say this larger button, if this cross section is right here with this whole diameter here, let's call that a large D, then that large D actually can imagine there's another shear stress along this, which is P divided by two pi and that big D with that big D over two. You see that? Two pi R. Okay, great. So there's a common application. Another one we already talked about, Let's say we have two plates. Let's say we have a lap splice on an aircraft and they're being pulled like this, right? So this is continuous sheet. It goes on and on and on like this, right? And let's say there's one fastener here. I'm gonna go back to our cross-sectional view. Let's say there's one fastener right there. If you pull here and you pull here, we got normal stress in the skin, but actually you can see, if you look at these two members and the load is transferring from the middle of this member to the middle of this member, you'll notice it has to go through this fastener. Imagine that hacksaw blade coming between there and cutting that off again. What does it have to cut? It has to cut through a little piece of the fastener that looks like this. The area of that piece is just pi r squared. And since we usually give fasteners in terms of diameter, not radius, we'd say pi d over 2 squared or pi over 4 d squared, right? So what's our shear stress on the fastener? It is fs equals p over pi pi d squared over four, right? This is just the area. And uh, this, is, this is just the area and this is just the force on that little fastener. If it fails, this fastener breaks. Now we're gonna learn about other checks soon, but that's the first check of shear fa of fasteners, whether it's a rivet, a bolt or whatever else. Got it? So when we drew, we said, hey, the line of action of this force is like this. The line of action of this force is like this. And if we look at that little fastener, which looks something like this, we saw that what it ended up doing is causing a shear stress where one part of the fastener is trying to go this way and the other part of the fastener is trying to go this way. And those two forces, P, are acting on this area, P over A. Got it? Great. Okay. What's our chat? So the X, Y, let's see a question from the chat. X, Y. So interrupt me if I'm, it's hard for me to keep an eye on the chat. So just blurt out question if you got a question, but that X, Y has to do with the idea that it's on both an X and a Y face. Remember? X face in the Y direction, Y face on the X direction. That's what the XY subscript means. Uh, okay, I think that, all right. So our shear stress here, P over A, we talked about this. P over C, that I'm using that for circumference. Uh, whatever that is, pi and the circumference is pi D and the other dimension remaining on that area is just the thickness. That's a very common formula for this kind of problem. Okay, here's another idea similar. Imagine that we have a, let's say you build a fence and you put a post in and you now you've embedded that post down into the ground and then somebody yanks on the post, right? Or like this, you have this rod embedded in concrete, let's say, and somebody pulls on it. Well, the first check you're going to do is a normal check, P over A, where the pay A is the cross-sectional area of that. That's a normal stress. Compare that to FQ. Then you get into the wall and you say, okay, well, if I don't fail that, we can imagine this piece back here. We're going to redraw it over here, and we can see everything that's embedded is from here to here. We can call that length, and we already have the diameter. So this area, if this is a force P, we're going to get a shear stress along this surface, or we could talk about a running load pounds per inch. The running load NS is just P over the circumference, which is pi D, right? And the stress is just, shear stress is just N 
over air uh, over the uh, T, which in this case, the thickness is going to be the length. So we say, what is the shear stress? It's just P over it, which is P over pi D and length in this case. You see how that works? Pi D was the first dimension. That is the pounds per inch going around the thing. And L is the remaining dimension to turn that into a stress. Okay. So those are some uh, special okay. cases and applications of this principle. Yes, question. Did somebody else have a question too? I couldn't tell. Well, Bucha Dow. Um, for the previous problem, um, the fastener one, uh, there's a sh we were looking at the shear stress where the small part of the bolt meets the flat part. Um, for a, like a problem like this, would you also have to take into account like where the flat part meets the surface that it's going through and that inner that uh, sure. the diameter so of the if, tube? If we think about this, we first have this force acting here. And our first check is of this shaft, it's gonna be the stress is P over A, where that's pi D squared over four, right? And we check that against FTU. No matter where we make a section cut, that check is the same. Then we get this up into the head. The next check is gonna be right there where we calculate the shear stress, which is P over A. And now the area is pi little d times thickness of the head. Now we're in that. Then what's going to happen is this force is going to radiate out, which means we actually could draw another little piece like this and do the same check for any section until we get to the next hole. Of course, the bigger that diameter is, that diameter gets larger and larger, that stress is dropping because the force isn't changing. Then we get the next force where we might be critical is right along where this interfaces with here. Then what actually keeps us? Imagine yourself dropping into the ice. You've got your arms out with a little hole and there's a little piece of ice here and you're trying to keep from being yanked down into the ice, right? A little shark is pulling you down as you're, right? You just, can you imagine that? Except let's say we have elbows that go all the way around like this. So what actually develops? So we actually were good on our shaft. We didn't break here. We're good for shear here at the shoulder and all the way out to there. Our stress is getting less and less as we go out. And then the next thing is you could just say, what is the bearing of my elbows, my arm, that's resting on the ice? And you can see that that's going to be a little annulus. If we take this little, not an anus, but an annulus. If we take this diameter here around there, that and this diameter. So if you look at this thing again, if this is the whole button and you see this is the hole in the plate here, then actually this area, we could call this DO, we could call this DI. And actually, the area of this will be DO squared over 4 minus DI squared over 4 times the, uh, that is the, times pi, right? That is, it's pi, is that minus this with pi. You see that? That's the total area. And that actually is a force down. So that's our area, our bearing area, which we haven't covered yet. And our, we're, we'll be dealing with that in next lecture. Our, we're going to get a bearing stress, BRG of P over A, and the bearing area is this. It's just pi big D squared over 4 minus pi little d squared over 4 is this area. And that's a bearing stress, and we'll learn about that next do, time. Do we multiply by thickness too, right? No, in this case, imagine if I take my hand and I put a force down on the table, do I multiply by a thickness? No, I take the force oh. over the area. Okay. The area is the area of my hand. Right. In, so this, last... case, in this case, the area is, is the area of that annulus. It's called an annulus. Annulus. What's an so annulus? the annulus? The last part is force. just another normal force or another, another normal stress? Yeah. It is, it, and it's called a bearing stress because it's talking about bearing. And once again, we're actually way ahead because that's actually next lecture, we'll deal with that problem. Right now, we already knew from first lecture we could handle this part of it. And now we're learning to evaluate the different shear pieces and next class we'll cover that bearing piece. Comprende? Te gusta? Nishi one ma? 
Okay. And we did this guy. All right. Oh, another kind of problem related to this guy here, like, we just covered the stresses and how we do that. Well, another question could be, how deep do you need to make this to keep it from yanking out of the wall? If the diameter is already set, how deep does it need to be? Well, it's just P over A and you just solve, you plug in FSU and you solve for whatever length you need, right? Piece of cake. Let's say you have a rod, a steel rod. It's got a allowable like 180 KSI. Let's say it's embedded in steel. Well, then it's just the steel allowable FSU. But what if you have a steel rod embedded in concrete? You would need to check both the shear stress against the steel allowable and the shear stress against the concrete allowable. Which one do you think will fail first? Concrete's probably only got a 500 PSI strength versus a 180 KSI. Big difference, right? You see that? So if you have multiple materials, Let's say you have. Uh, uh, let's oh, say you God. have a, a sword, and it's you've got a sword in the stone, right? You want to be Arthur, and so you start yanking on this sword, which is good. Let's say the sword doesn't fail in tension. Which is going to fail in shear? Will the sword fail in shear, or will the stone fail in shear? assuming you're strong enough to pull it out. The stone, probably. The stone is going to fail. Hopefully. What if your sword is made of jello in the stone? It's the exact same shear stress, but now the sword is going to fail. You're going to get a slip, slip plane. You're going to pull out a piece of jello that's shaped like a sword, but missing a thin film that failed inside the hole. So the limiting factor for embedded materials on like shear stress is the weaker shear ultimate stress? Well, sure, but pretty much for anything. Let's say we have a rod, it's made of two materials. We've got a steel down on this part and a copper down on this part. Which one is gonna fail? It's gonna fail down here in the Probably. copper. If we take a steel rod and we embed it, in, in aluminum, what's going to fail? Is the steel going to fail or is the aluminum going to fail in shear? Probably the aluminum. The aluminum fail. What if you have aluminum rod stuffed into a steel part? Once the, again, aluminum. the aluminum. Now the aluminum rod will fail. Whatever's weaker will fail. You can practice this. You can make me a set of brownies and put in a little piece of uh, candy cane. Which one fails? Brownie. I don't even like brownies. Chocolate chip cookies before you cook. Isn't chocolate? How many guys think that chocolate chip cookie dough is better than the actual cookie? I learned, me too. I learned that a long time ago. My sister used to get really ticked. She would hide the cookie dough all over the place because if I saw the, I'd be, she, even if she makes me cookies, she's getting there cooking me cookies. I go in there, I start taking clumps of dough, right? She's like, get out of the cookies. I'm not done, right? I'm talking, this is going back 40 years or some long period. <laughs> what are you doing, right? I'm like, I want the cookie dough. She goes, wait till I'm done. I said, I don't want them when you're done. I want them now. <laughs> The cookie dough is better than the cookie. I've always felt that, but actually, as I've gotten older or more mature, I've found that that's more and more true, and I get more bold with stating it, even though that kind of runs contrary to the political correctness, right? You're supposed to wait till the cookies are cooked before you eat them. At least that's what I heard. Okay. <sighs> is anybody learning anything? Oh yeah, so I agree with you, boneless cookies. Oh, I like that, boneless cookies. Point for Mr. Key. And I agree, so point for you too, Diego, because I actually, if we're not gonna eat them when they're raw, then eat them when they're really soft, especially the middle, right? That's what Gar uh, Smeagol says, right? Like some rough and riddling. All right, let's get back to something that's actually useful. <laughs> okay, 
Now we're going to start looking at the idea. So what I talked about that romantic thing has to do with what we're going to call pure sheer stress. And I think Leon was already kind of expressed realizing that I was actually talking about something very specific, pure shear versus direct shear. So what's the difference? All right. Let's say we have a little piece. Let's say it's a thin piece and it's got these dimensions. It's a little tiny incremental element. Okay. And we put a force here. Now let's say that this is hanging out in space. I'm grabbing it here and it's hanging in space. If I apply a force here, what happens? There's nothing up here to react the shear. There's nothing down here to react the shear. There's only a reaction over here. That means this force is reacted by a force here and I can't go into a pure shear straight, can I? Let me draw it here. <clears throat> If we have a force applied here and there's something here, but there's nothing on top and nothing on bottom, then I have a reaction there, right? It's gonna be equal to P, but there's nothing down here. This is empty, this is empty. That means we have nothing to develop a force along here and here. We'll call that direct shear. What actually happens? This force induces a moment about this point, doesn't it? That means we're going to get a bending moment, a reactive bending moment. We're not ready to calculate. I mean, we can calculate that from statics. We're not ready to deal with that stress-wise yet. But we shouldn't forget that that's going to develop a moment. And this is why we're going to find out with this kind of problem, we're going to get a shear stress that varies from top to bottom. We'll be, we're not going to do that until lecture 16. So so like an example of that would be like, I don't know, like a, some kind of where it's just like sitting down and kind of pulling down on it. Like there's a shear oh, pulling wow. down on like a. How about this? Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is in direct shear. It's actually also in bending. But if we just focus on the shear part, we could take any cross section through here and take this force P over A. That means P over this times this. Is the stress, can you guys picture that? P over this times this. That's the stress, right? Shear stress. Is that different here from here? No. No matter where I make a cut, this force, no matter where I cut this off, I got a reaction equal to that. That means the shear stress is constant going from end to the end. Through that? And that'd be the side area, right? Mr. Brown, huh? And it'd be the side area? It will be the that area right there. This times this. P. Now, if we go this way, it's still the same area. It's just I'm going to get a lot less deflection. Why? Because actually it's got, we're going to get the same exact shear deflection. We're going to get a less moment deflection. We'll deal with that later. We're not ready for that. That's not until lecture 11. Okay. But right now what we're looking at is we're saying, okay, we got a part. We have a force here. There's nothing but a reaction over at this end. Therefore, this force is reacted here and nothing can happen here. Nothing can happen there. That means it's direct shear. <clears throat> In that case, what's going to happen is this thing can't move along here. We're going to get a little deflection. If we ignore bending deflection, because we're not ready to deal with that, we just look at the shear deflection. It's going to go into a phase. You'll notice there's no deformation of it. It's like if you imagine, can you picture this? Imagine this is a bunch of quarters. Imagine this part is a stack of quarters. Can you imagine that? And let's say they're like, they, they love each other. They're kind of like magnetically attached together. And then you put this, and it's reacted over here. You put a force here. What happens is each of these quarters slide. So this slides a little bit, and this slides a little so actually, this one does can't slide. This one slides a little bit. This one slides a little more. This one slides a little more. This one slides a little more. This one slides a little. And when you're done, it goes into this shape. You see that? No bending deformation, because we ain't ready to deal with that yet. But this sliding deformation, everything is shear. It's P over perpendicular, uh, excuse me, P over parallel area. You got that? Like this. OK. We could talk about the strain then. Let's stick with this case for a minute before we slip over to the pure shear case. And uh, I got to keep an eye on the time so I don't get too excited and go too slow. 
All right, if we look at this, we see we're gonna get a little deflection here. Now, remember that we talked before about the uh, strain is just deflection over original length. And if we're talking about axial loads, and this is an axial deflection and an axial length for an axial strain. But for shear, we're talking about the shear strain is gonna be a deflection over a length, sure, but it's a deflection in one direction over a length in another direction. Look at this. This is a deflection in that direction divided by a length over this direction. It's that over this or this over that, depending on which way you want to say it. You got it? So actually, our strain, and we're going to use gamma for that, is actually the deflection in the y over the incremental length in the x. I'm using a dx here for incremental length. We could just call it L, right? This deflection over that original length. You see that? I have a quick question. Yes. So when you're solving for that, would you always look at the deflection first and that determines what length it is? Because it's always is always going to depend on the deflection, uh, like uh, component. Sure. So let's say we just uh, let's say we go to a diving board. We got a, a a nice new pool. Oh, let me back up here and let me turn on my pen again. Looks like I turned it off. Let's say we have a pool, and there's a diving board. We don't know anything about bending, so we're just going to talk about shear. We have a force here. We're going to say, okay, what is the length of the diving board? It is L. And then we apply this force and this thing moves right down to here. This is our deflection from here to here. What is our shear deflect, our shear strain? It is just our deflection divided by our length. The deflection in the force direction divided by the length perpendicular to the force direction. Does that make, did answer your question? You got it? Or if we're talking an infinitesimal little area, like we're talking about here, it's just that little deflection divided by the length in this direction, which we can, we can call delta x, dy over dx. But you'll notice I used a different symbol. I used delta for to say that this is just a length, but it's an incremental length. And this delta to say it's a deflection. Got it? Okay. So that is direct shear. You'll notice there was nothing top and bottom, nothing on the edges. So we can't, remember, shear stresses want to be romantic, mouth to mouth. You apply this force here, there's nothing up here. It can't develop that stress. It can't develop this stress. It can only develop one there. That's why it's direct shear. Okay. When we get over here, we're going to have a different case. All right. So I'm going to erase this crap. And we will now say that's called direct shear. The only reaction goes long left as the moment develops is this blah, 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 blah. We said all that. Okay. Got it. All right. Now let's deal with the other case. Let's take, let's do once again, let's take a little infinitesimal area. This is kind of like if you have a continuous thing, like let's say we have a fuselage or let's just say we have a skin, a big old piece like this of metal. And let's say it's held out here and held out, just like on a skin, right? If we have a fuselage skin, any little piece, if we look at a little incremental element like this, it's like it's in a huge restrained sheet, a 500 by 500 sheet of thin metal. Can you imagine that? And we're going to focus on one little element here. And now we're going to grab that little element and we're going to apply a little shear force like this. That means it's going to be reacted like this. Is there material up here that can develop some loading, some stress? Yes. What's going to happen is if you apply this force, if you apply this force downward to this, this thing is going to try and deflect downward. And that means, that means it's going to move this place up. If you see this going down and this coming up, you'll notice this thing is going like this. And actually what's going to happen is you're going to get a deflection like this. This force causes a stress along this edge that's reacted by a stress along this edge. But because it's continuous metal, this can't move. As that thing tries to go like this, 
It try and get longer. Look, this, this one diagonal is getting longer. Can you see that? And since it's getting longer, this is resisting it and this is resisting it in the same direction. This is resisting it and this is resisting it. And also this is trying to get longer. So this is resisting it and this is, so actually what happens is this stress is making this get longer along here. And this actually is being resisted like this. So this is developing a shear stress like this and it's reacted by a shear stress because this is all resisting that motion. Because this is in a continuous sheet of plate, there's something up here and something up here. So if I put a shear here, it's gonna be reacted by a romantic little shear stress, okay? Even if it was the same dimensions of the little element, we now have a stress, which actually has a, stress, a shear stress on all four faces. Now, so that is what we're gonna call pure shear because it's a little incremental element in a continuous piece. And we're gonna call this pure shear stress. Now, when we deflect this, you'll notice this was, react, was held here. So the only deflection we could get was here, but now we're gonna see a little deflection there and a little deflection there as this thing pulls away from the original point and gets longer and longer and longer. You see that? We got a deflection here. So if we want to deal with that, we actually say, okay, well, look, we're getting a little shear strain here, delta X over delta, uh, excuse me, delta Y over delta X. And we're getting a little shear strain over here, which is delta X over delta Y. The total shear strain is the summation of these two. summation. We're going to call that the engineering strain. Because if we want to know, so let's say, let's say I grab your ear and I pull all down on it. That would be a little bit irritating, wouldn't it? But if I pull on your other ear up, you're twice as irritated. You got that? If we want to know how much stress is caused, we'd have to account for both strains. Actually, I almost pulled too hard. My buddy got his ear ripped off in a rugby game at Long Beach State. The guy was a stud, skinny, uh, skinny Australian dude. He, he was back playing the next week. His ear was half ripped off. He had a patch on his head. Of course, the other team, everybody went for his head on everything, right? So we were swinging fists and trying to protect this guy because he was so tough. He's out there playing right after getting his ear ripped off. What a stud. Anyway. That has nothing to do with this class. Oh, back to this. Twice the stress. So if we want to relate, remember Hooke's Law relating stress to strain? If we want to relate to stress to strain, we're going to need to count for all of the strain, which means both of these, that's engineering strain. Now, let's say we want to know where does this ear go? Well, in that case, we only want to deal with the strain on this ear, right? We'd only deal with one piece, not both. Because this ear just goes down according to this for this strain, and this one goes up according to its strain. But if we need to figure out how much stress is associated with that strain, we need to use both. You with me? This is the difference between true strain and engineering strain. Engineering strain is used to relate stress to strain, and we need to count for all of it, and that we use both. True strain is looking at where is the thing at. And we're going to use one, or in, in this case, what we would use is the average. We take these two together, we divide them by two to use the average strain in the element. You with me? Now you might think be thinking, who cares? Okay, here's why we care. Because this class and next class, we're going to be dealing with engineering strain. We're going to need to count for all of it. But when we get, if you come back, if you're glutton for punishment, you come to finite elements where we're using the deflection method, we're gonna be using that still. We're also gonna need, be needing to know precise strains. So we're gonna to need to be using both true strains and engineering strains. True strains when we're dealing with where something goes, engineering strains when we're dealing with stress strain relationship. If you come back for, if you're really a glutton for punishment, you also come for composites, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna use true strain and engineering strain in different times 
One when we're relating stress to strain and one where we're, when we're figuring out where something actually moves to. That's a gross simplification, but it's mostly true. And if you grip that now, that will make later stuff easier. Got it? Okay, for our purposes, question. What is the total strain in the left part, the direct shear part? It's delta Y over delta X. What is the total strain or engineering strain in the right direct shear part? It is delta Y X, excuse me, delta Y over delta X plus delta X over delta Y. In the left case, what is the true strain? Same as the engineering strain. In the right case, what is the true strain? Half the engineering strain. Got it? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, and this has the idea if you take that force or take the stress, multiply by the area times the distance, stress times the area times the distance, that's going to give you a moment. You'll notice those moments are perfectly canceling themselves out. There's no moment in pure strain, in pure shear. In direct shear, there is a moment. Force times the distance because you have a force applied and it's not reacted till over here. But with pure shear, we have a force, it's reacted over here, but we also have a corresponding force, which is reacted down here. And we look at these two times, they're one and then one, you, and against these two times, they're one and one, they cancel each other out. No matter where you sum the moments, they cancel themselves out. No moment, pure shear. That's what we call pure shear. Surprise, surprise. Got it? Okay. <sighs> Blah, 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 blah. We said all this. Okay, so once again, we said, look, we said for direct shear, for direct shear, we have our strain is deflection over length. And actually the tangent of that, right? The tangent of that angle is equal to this, which means we could say that this angle Right, the tangent of this angle is equal to this quantity. Therefore, we can say that the angle is actually this quantity. But remember back in trig when they say if the angles are small, then the tangent is just the angle, right? The tangent of an angle is just the angle if the, if the angle is small enough. They did this for a reason, so we can basically say this is just equal to this. So actually the shear strain actually also has to do with this angle. It's this over this. Why? Because delta Y over delta X, the arc tangent of that is about equal to just delta Y over delta X. And that's even simpler to do. So forget doing this. We'll just say that's the angle. And we're also defining that as our shear strain. Gamma. Got it? Okay. That's for direct shear. If we have here, here, then actually we've got both of those and now we're adding those mothers together, right? Okay, that's the engineering strain and this true strain would be half of that value. This over that, remember this is just a length, but it's a length that's perpendicular. This is just a length, it's a length that's perpendicular to that. This is actually deflection. The reason there's a delta here and here is because we're talking about an incremental value, which we could just call LX and LY. You got it? But we're drawing attention to the idea that we got a little one by one or a little tiny increment by tiny increment part. Okay. All right. Erase that crap and we will move on. All right. Blah, blah, blah. We talked about this, talked about this, talked about this. Okay, so since our strain is defined as deflection over original or perpendicular directional length, right? And now you know that this actually corresponds with that angle, but we could also just call it the strain. We now can rearrange this and solve for the deflection. Deflection in that direction is just the, she the shear strain times whatever the length is. That means if we know what the shear strain is, we can calculate the shear deflection by just multiplying by that perpendicular length. I have a quick question. 
Yes, stand by one second. Remember Hooke's law? Stress equals EE -E for axial load. Axial stress equals E times axial, right? Now we're going to get Hooke's law for shear stresses, which is shear stress equals shear strain times G, the shear modulus, which is right below. If you look in your allowable hand in your uh, appendix, you got E, you're going to see an ES that we're not going to use. And then you're going to see G, which is the shear modulus. So if you know this, you multiply by that and you have this. If you know this, you multiply, you divide by this and you got that. You got it? Okay, yes, what's your question? So is this only for the small angles? Because I read that yes, in the last slide. Yes, only for okay. small angles. And that means what do you think we're going to apply it to? Absolutely everything and pretend everything's a small angle. <laughs> so, And professor. then... If oh, we sorry. actually get a big angle, we're going to say, oh, it's probably not correct. It's more and more approximate as our angles get big. Does that make so, sense? Pr professor, I just want to add on to that question. Yes. So because we're dealing with small angles, um, will we ever get to the point in this class where we deal with larger angles and hence we don't use the small angle approximation for the shear strain? No, we're not going to. Uh, the closest we're going to get to that is when we get to uh, plastic bending, but even then, so it gets really complicated. Remember, we're taking the mysteries of the universe. We have, mankind is pretty clever. The whole idea of science is looking at what we can see and measure and coming up with some kind of thing that looks like it approximates it, and then we pretend it's gospel, but it's really only valid in a little tiny thing. We're taking some really complicated things that mankind has come up with a few laws that mostly work in our experience. And we're going to find that if we deal with plasticity, it gets really hard. So mostly we're going to pretend everything's elastic unless we really want to get it complicated. And even then we're going to make these gross simplifying assumptions, which are only valid in a small band of things. So mostly we're going to give you all these assumptions but when we give you these assumptions, we means we're going to pretend like this is stuff you can count on, even though we recognize the further outside of these assumptions, like small deflections we get, the more error we have, but we don't really have a better way to calculate it that we're capable of solving repeatedly. All right, you guys got the idea of, okay, engineering strain and true strain or, or tensor strain is another word for that other one. Okay. All right. We know about margins of safety. We've talked about that. We talked about the factor of safety 1.5 we're mostly using. We talked about this FSU over FS. Let's figure out how to get allowables. What you're going to do is you're going to pull up your handbook. You're going to say, okay, what material do I have? Let's say we have a, let's say we have this material. Uh, 70, 071 thick, 7075 T6 sheet. Okay. And we want need to evaluate a shear stress, which means so I'm not saying use the shear allowable. What I'm telling you is you have a shear applied to a part. You're going to go, oh, what's the corresponding stress? I get a shear stress. What allow am I going to need? I'm going to need a shear allowable. So what we're going to do, we're going to come here. We're going to say, okay, where's the 7075? Oh, there it is. Great. It's a 7075 sheet. Perfect. Then I'm going to look for the T6, right? So first I'm going to say, okay, I found the right material. Then I'm going to say, I found the right temper. You see the T6 temper? Same thing we did for axial loads. Then we're going to say we're going to find the right thickness. Where does our thickness apply? 0.071 applies to that band. Now we're going to use A or B basis. B, B. basis. Remember, B basis, if you read the appendix, the very start of the appendix, B basis for redundant structures, A basis for non-redundant structures. Most of the structures in the aircraft are redundant. So for our class, we're going to use B basis for absolutely everything because that's usually what you should use in industry. Not always, but usually. So then we come here, we go to the B basis column and we see, look, FSU 48 KSI. Is the shear allowable more or less than the tension allowable? Less than tension. It's a little more than half. So we're gonna learn later in this class about how to estimate shear strength from tension strength. The easiest way is just take FTU and divide it by two. That's a bit conservative. It's actually usually a bit higher than that, like 0.65, maybe 0.577, depending on a bunch of factors. We'll learn different ways for estimating, but it's a little more than 50%. Got it? But we're going to look here and find our allowable just like that. And look, here's your G down here. You see your G 
So a 10.3 MSI E is corresponds with a 3.9 MSI, or that means million PSI G. Got it? Okay, great. We talked about this. This is Hooke's law for axial load. This is Hooke's law for shear, for shear, axial stresses, shear stresses. Got it? Piece of cake. Okay. Oh, thermal strains. All right. Remember when we were talking normal stresses, we got a deflection associated with temperature change equal to alpha delta T. That gave us a temperature change. And that gave us a temperature change, gave us a chain, a deflection, which means we have a strain. We don't have a stress unless we're restrained. Now, when we talk about thermal, let's just imagine a block, a cube. It's perfectly, and let's change the temperature. Does it get longer? Yes. Does it get thicker? Yes. Does it get wider? Yes. Do these chain, do these dimensions all happen? simultaneously and basically evenly. Yes, is there any distortion in the part? No. Therefore, there is no shear, there's no distortion of the part. Therefore, there's no shear strain associated with thermal stress. It's getting normal deflections are bigger, but the shear, there's no shear, unless there's like a discontinuity in the material, or a constraint that doesn't allow it to move the way it wants in the axial ways, and that could end up inducing shear stresses. That's too complicated for us. We ain't gonna deal with that. Got it? Great. Okay, this ugly slide, and you can actually study this a bit, is just a way of saying, hey, look, if you look through all this crap, blah, 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 and look down here to the bottom, this means there are limits and Poisson's ratio is gonna be somewhere between zero and a half. There are some weird materials where you can get a negative Poisson's ratio or something bigger than a half, but you probably will never run into them unless you're doing grad, uh, complicated research, okay? What is Poisson's ratio usually for us? Lateral strain over axial strain. Magnitude. It'd be 0.33. Yeah, point. Point 0.3 or point 0.33. If you ever get a value different than that, you're probably wrong. It is true there are a few materials we might deal with what might be as low as like point 0.2 ish, but most everything we're going to see is going to be either point 0.3 or point 0.31 or point 0.32 or point 0.33. Got it? Okay. That's all you need to know about this slide. This slide here, all you need to know about this is that there's a relationship. Are you with me? Don't you guys love that idea? We're talking shear stresses. We got so much relationship. We got feel the love with our shear stresses, right? And also now we're talking relationship. What's the relationship? E, G, and mu. Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, and the shear modulus are related. How are they related? That equation. You can use that form or this form. Got it? That means if you have any two, you've got the third. Piece of cake? Will we use this in this class? Uh, maybe. Hardly at all, but you should never forget this. Do you have to memorize it? Ah, it'd be good to memorize it, but you could just know where to find it in your book in case you need it. Got it? Okay. Last idea is the idea of strain energy. We dealt with this for normal stresses and we deal with these for shear stresses. How do we do it? Now we're going to apply a force and now we're going to get a flexion. Remember, deflection is in the direction of the force, but actually the reason it's moving is no longer an axial strain, but a shear strain. So we're still talking force, deflection, the same exact direction, but it's not defle deflecting because of lengthening, it's deflecting because of shearing. You see that difference? That means if we apply a force here, we're gonna take the parallel area and evaluate the deflection over this length here for the strain, and we're gonna do our energy that way. You wanna see how it works? Bang, 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 bang. That was easy. What do you need to know? Do you need to be able to derive this? No, you don't need to derive this. Let's just focus on a minute. Let's write this differently. This is just strain energy here. 
This is just the force. For example, remember this part here? Force P, if we wanted to calculate the stress for that, we would say P over A. That means this distance over the thickness, right? What's the length? In this case, it would be this length. What's the area? It's this area. Let's just imagine. Oh, actually, if we're talking a force here, then actually we're talking that force over that area. Got that? That's our stress. That's the area we're talking about. And we got the G. So we can say it's just P L P squared L over 2AG. You just got to be careful. Let's say we have this part. Let's say we have it fixed here and we apply a force here, P. Let's say it's a thin piece like this. What is the shear stress? What is our, we look at our little equation, U equals P squared L over 2AG. What is our P? Well, there's our P, bang, that's easy. What is our length? Now looks, the force is going this way. The perpendicular length is going to be actually this dimension that goes right there. What is the area? Well, that force is acting on this parallel area here. That's the area we need to plug in down there. What's G? We look up in the back of our book for the material. There's our G. Bang, baby. Got it? Simple. If I ask you for the shear strain energy, that's what you calculate. I think that's todos. But we're basically done. Comprende? Te gusta? Nishi ma? That's all we got. Okay.